today we're going to read, uh, we're going to start working through Romans 5, 12 through 21. Um, and these 10 verses hold, I think, one of the most countercultural things you're going to see in all of Romans. Um, it, may not, it may not strike you as that, but I'm going to try to paint the picture and see if you agree with me after I give you some reasons why. Um, but for those of us who have lived a few years, I don't know if you ever lived under a paradigm where you thought something was true, and you lived maybe for decades thinking something was true, and then something happened, maybe in a moment or maybe gradually, where you realize everything you believed up to that point was just wrong. <laughs> it was just wrong. There's some movies like that where you can watch a movie and you think it's one way, and at the very end, one thing is said, and the flashbacks go back, and you go, oh, I was interpreting this thing completely wrong, and you completely reinterpret it. That's, that's called a, it's, it's like a different perspective. You might have a, diff, a worldview of the way things are supposed to work, and you realize, well, that's not really how they work, and it's pretty shocking. Um, and at first, if, if you're like me, you try to reconcile with what you thought was true. <laughs> you say, okay, well, how does that fit with what I think is true? And after a period of time, as you struggle with this, you may lose some sleep and you're trying to work through this because it's really important to you. You can't, you can't figure out how to fit those two things together. And you realize, mm -hmm. I have to choose between this is true and this is false, or this is true and this is false. There's no way to make the two things match together. May and, go ahead. This says, Adam sin results in death for all. Mm -hmm. Did Adam ever ask for forgiveness? Uh, we might get to that. Okay. I can't. I can't easily answer that because it's not really. Uh, it's not really stated. Okay. Um, but the amazing, um, if you look at the meaning of this passage and lay it over the dominant worldview that's out there and the assumptions that's out there, you're going to really be forced to choose between what you read in these ten verses or what the world says is true. You can't. There's no way to match them both. That's that's what I've come to the conclusion. And the amazing thing to me is that what's the most countercultural thing in the whole passage is not even the main point of the passage, um, which I'll, I'll show you what I mean by it. Um, let, me, let me start by reading these verses here. The Romans 5, 12 through 21. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. In verse 16, and the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. And really, the main point comes here in these last three verses. For as by the one man, man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. I would like to put an amen there. But, um, so that as sin reigned in death, Grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the main point of this passage, if you want, for those of you who like the main point, you say, well, what's all that? Because it is very, it takes a little bit to work through that, and you might have had a hard time following the logic. I sure did. I almost had to. Remember those, those, those of you who went to school many moons ago like I did? Remember we used to have to diagram sentences? Yeah. Remember that nightmare of yeah. this connected to that and how it had all, yeah, this is, I almost had to pull all these things apart to understand what it was saying. I couldn't just read through it and go, oh yeah, I know what that means. It's not as simple as for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It wasn't something simpler. I, I know that can be deeper too, but it wasn't as simple to understand as that. But this is what I came to conclusion of the main point is coming from verses 
19 through 21, that through Adam's disobedience, we are all sinners. Through Christ's obedience, many can be righteous. The law increases sin, but even where sin increases, grace abounds even more. Sin reigns in death. Grace reigns through righteousness, which leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's really the summary. And I believe what Paul is trying to do here, because remember, we ended on reconciliation in verse 11. We've been reconciled to God. And he starts off with, therefore, just as one man, you might, might say, okay, well, how do these two things connect? And really, in all the commentaries, I have maybe six or seven, because I love Romans. So I have six or seven commentaries, and I've got some theological books and things like that. And out of six or seven books, there's at least 12 different opinions on what this, how they connect to each other. So to me, I think this idea is just building on what, uh, what he's saying. is like, how did we get reconciled? How can one person <laughs> reconcile all of us? And, and he's going to, I think, make the case of, well, you do believe that through one man we're all sinners, right? Yes. Okay, well then why, is, I mean, using that same logic, surely through one man's righteousness, we all can be righteous. I think that's the logic that Paul is using here to the Jewish mind or to the Middle Eastern mind. Um, so um, since you have the main point here, you might say, well, great, we can move on to chapter six because that's, that's really the answer. And what I saw here, though, is, and you don't have to read too deeply into it, you can see a lot of contrast there's a lot of contrast here between death and life, grace and law, uh, between obedience and disobedience. There's, I counted at least 25 different contrasts, like this versus this, this versus this, just in these 10 verses. They're just, they're just all over the place. And I'll give you a few of them here in a second. But um, why didn't you just say this? Why didn't you just say, okay, through Adam was sin, through Christ's righteousness, you know, sin um, is trespass, and uh, righteousness leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, and go on. Um, I think what he's doing here, and what God is doing through him, is he's explaining to us why there's so much suffering and pain and death in this world. Um, and really, when you look at it, what he's saying is that death is not a natural part of this life. We are so used to death being part of the world. Uh, the circle of life, right? It is not how God designed it. It is not. We're so used to it. It's so much a part of the water we swim in as a fish that we can't understand there might be air outside of the water. But if you really listen to what he's saying, he's saying that death came because of sin. The reason you might say, well, why is there so much suffering? Why do children die? Why is there so much cancer? Why is there so much disease? And the answer is sin. Ultimately, not because it's just a part of life or, well, you smoked too much, you did this and that. I mean, it doesn't matter if you didn't smoke, you're still going to die. Right? Death is undefeated. So it says that sin existed before. Okay, so I guess my question centers around what exactly is the definition of sin? Is it from the spiritual world that was let into and we were susceptible to? Or is it our own? I mean, our actions obviously right. are a product of sin. But what is and where is it? Did it come from? You have, you have hit on something that I struggle with as I was working on this. And I actually have a whole slide that asks that question and goes through some of the things. Um, the conclusion is not very satisfying to me, but I take it by faith what is not. Because some people will try to try to help God out and give answers for it, but Scripture does not teach that. In fact, it teaches against some of the conclusions that people make. But, but hold that thought. I promise, I'm looking at my time, yes, I think I can make that promise, that we will get to it. Um, but I just wanted to paint the... I really wanted to kind of poke your paradigm that death is a part of life. <laughs> Scripturally, it is by what we experience, but it wasn't the original design. So if you look at before Adam's sin, and you look at after our glorification, the description of how the world is does not include death, does not include suffering, does not include disease. So why here in this period is there so much death? Is there so much disease? And um, it's not just death, like we think of dying. Think about every time you have, um, you know, as, as you need glasses, <laughs> We need glasses. Well, that is a deterioration. That's a, a slow march towards death, right? I mean, really, from the time that we're born, from the time we're conceived, our body is degrading to the point where we will die. So our life is filled with decay and death. 
and um, entropy would be the scientific term for it. You know, the, the fact I heard one pastor once say, I, I wish I could remember who it was, it just stuck with me. He said, you know that there's entropy in the world because you don't, you don't clean up your closet and it stays clean. <laughs> You always have to clean up your closet. If you have kids, they don't clean up their rooms once and it stays clean. Right? Mm. And those who are parents are smiling even more, mm -hmm. right? Because it just naturally, even if nobody touches it, even if it's in a house that nobody's been in, it just decays. There's just decay nice. all around us. And think about all the human institutions we have that fight against that. Everything from medicine to police to government to uh, military. I mean, just think of all the institutions we have that fight against death and decay in this world. And it all comes back what Paul is saying here. That's why I'm saying this is the most countercultural thing. I think one of the most countercultural things in all of Romans that impact the widest group of people, both the saved and the unsaved, the unbelievers and the believers. It impacts everybody. Um, is this, and, and there's a futility, too, of life. If there wasn't, if because of death, people, poets and uh, people like that have written, said, well, there's futility. I mean, there's so much futility in life because I'm going to die. You say, well, why is there futility? Well, think about if you were a scientist, the smartest person in the world in your field. What happens when you die? It's gone. So why am I? I mean, I can work really hard and become the richest man in the world. What does the Ecclesiastes say? Me that I'm going to die and my money is going to go to people who don't care, who didn't earn it or going to waste it, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the point of earning? I mean, there's a futility. And in Ecclesiastes, use this word, this Hebrew word called hovel. Um, which is um, hard to interpret, but it's this idea of mist or smoke or vapor. Um, you know, if you've ever seen smoke, like a real wall of smoke, how it just kind of changes shape, and you reach out to grab that shape, and the shape is gone. And that's the picture that he has of, of life, the things you pursue. It's just, it's, it's here and it's gone. Uh, because there's death, futility has been introduced to our lives. We're chasing after the wind, so to speak. Um, so where did that come from? And uh, he says here that it came from Adam's sin. And uh, I want to point out that there are a couple contrasts in here. I'm just going to give you a few. I'll let you chase them down. I don't have time to go through all of them. But there's Adam versus Jesus. There's death versus life. Disobedience versus obedience. A few others. There's trespass versus the free gift. And there is the law that increases trespasses, which is in itself is an amazing statement. You think mm -hmm. that law is there to bring order, and it makes life more... Um, uh, law abiding, and that's not what scripture says. Multiple places it says that the law came so that sin might increase. And right here it says it very explicitly that the reason law came is so sin would increase. And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. But I think it will when you see where death came from and where the sin. And notice that sin is singular here. Adam's sin. And, um, and he talks about all men sinned, speaking of past tense, but that's a singular past tense. That's not sins. They didn't sin multiple times, they sin in Adam. So in Adam, we all sinned one time. Um, so there's two sides to it. So I want to I just address it by asking one question today, and you'll see it goes pretty deep, but because it's such a wide-ranging um, impact to how you see the world, and hopefully you do see the world a little differently, see what's going on a little differently uh, based on what Scripture teaches us here. Just going to ask the question, how does Adam's sin affect us? And the next week, Lord willing, if I can get through all of through Adam, then we'll look at how does Jesus' obedience affect us. So let's start at the beginning. What was Adam's sin? Um, this will begin to answer, answer your question about the sin. Um, if you go to Genesis, you don't have to turn here. You probably know this story. It's the command that God gave Adam. He said, and the Lord God commanded the man, that's Adam, which by the way, his name means man, so it's sort of a, a pun. Adam means man or earth or... Um, of the earth. He says, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. Um, I'm compelled to show you that a lot of times we focus on what we're not supposed to do, but notice there is a positive there as well. Did Adam we, know what death was? No. And, and so, I, I don't, well, he never saw it, so I don't know if he does or not. Right. <laughs> yeah, the Bible doesn't tell us whether he knew, but, but notice there's a positive to this as well. Um, and Satan comes in and doesn't say, look at all these other trees you can eat from. <laughs> right? He always harps on the thing that we can't have, and that's what we want. We want what we can't have. We, don't, we are not satisfied with all that God's had. So sin really is a rejection of all God's good 
so we can have what he told us not to have. And uh, anyway, just want to point that out. So he told them not to. Then in um, Genesis 3, 6, um, you can go all the end of verse 6. It just says, and he ate. And I was really surprised that there wasn't more. That's just his sin. The two words in all the Bible, all of this sin, all the impact I just talked about comes down to two words in Genesis 3, 6, and he ate. The rest of us talking about the woman saw this, that was good, and this and that, and this and that, and gave it to him. And what does it say about, Ab- about I keep saying Abraham, Adam, he ate. That's it, that's what it says. What are the two words? He ate. <laughs> that's what it says, he ate. Mm-hmm. Um, so God says, don't eat. And it says, he ate. He ate. Right? That was, that was the sin. They didn't then, even know they were naked till then. Right. I mean, why? But Romans 5, 12, what we were just reading says, sin came into the world by one man. So that is the sin that we're looking at, is that disobedience of God. Mm-hmm. Um, the phrase came into the world, people interpret that different ways. Some people think, well, sin was invented by Adam. If it wasn't for Adam, sin wouldn't be in the world. Um, it's not that Adam invented sin. Adam introduced sin into the world. And by the world, it's not just the world of mankind that is true. The way I like to describe it is it's the world of the created order that was man down. So if you look at scripturally, it was Adam and everybody that descended from Adam, but also everything that he was put over, all of creation. So a lot of times we think about our death, of course, we think about that, but think about the trillions of animals and the suffering in this world that comes because of the head of Adam sinned, right? All death in the world comes because of Adam, is what I believe the Bible teaches, and I'll give some reasons for that in a second. David, can you imagine, honestly, being so innocent up to that point? I mean... No. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I can't. Again, you're like talking to a fish that swims in the water to imagine a place where there's no water. I mean, how can I imagine that? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's like tell, telling Noah that it's going to rain. He's never seen rain. What is rain? Mm-hmm. <laughs> How do you describe that to somebody that hasn't seen it? But in Romans 8, 19 through 22, and again, I don't have time to go read through all of this, but it talks about the creation, the creation, all of creation waits in eager anticipation for the sons of God to be revealed, right? We're going to, we're going to be revealed, but why is creation waiting for us, God's children, to be revealed? Um, it goes on to say that the creation itself is under bondage to corruption. Um, how is it under bondage? Well, they were placed, they were subjected to futility. That's the word, that's where I got the word futility. They were subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. So basically, they were subjected to futility because of Adam's sin. And uh, they are released from that bondage and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God because we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth up till now. is what, And they still, still are because we've not been glorified yet. So think about that. The whole nature is looking at us and waiting for us to be glorified. Why are they waiting for that? Why is it waiting for that? Because it knows that it will be freed from its bondage. Um, do you think, I mean, you just asked, do you think oceans want to have tsunamis? Do you think the earth wants to have earthquakes? Do you think the volcanoes want to erupt? I mean, I'm personifying things that we see as nature, but in, uh, in the Psalms it says the trees clap their hands, the rivers, the rivers sing, the mountains stand as witness. So there is some aspect of, um, of longing there, of groaning, of wanting. Um, and Balaam's donkey uh, is interesting. Uh, there's just a few places that give us a hint, but it doesn't say that the angel gave the donkey the ability to talk. It says it loosed his mouth. So it's weird. It's a very interesting way to say it. It's almost as if he could, God has said, you can't speak anymore. And he said, okay, you can talk just this once. And then it talks. I mean, it's really fascinating um, um, how that works. But anyway, um, so the sin of Adam has comprehensive impacts on every per- person and every created thing we can see. Um, so if any of you has a fairness gene... Um, you're probably thinking, well, that was Adam, not me. <laughs> Why am I held accountable for him? Especially here in America, as individual as we are. Well, I didn't do that. I Why am I held accountable to that? Have you ever thought that? I have. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think the answer to that question is important to understand to grasp the, the, the dire situation all of us are in. Um, because we, the very fact that people can give you the answer when you witness to them, oh, I think I'm basically good, right? And I'll stand before God someday and he'll weigh my good and my bad and um, that shows not only do they have a misunderstanding of the holiness of God and the, the, the depths of sin, but also they don't understand the corruption of their nature to begin with. 
And so when you answer this question, it helps you understand the corruption of uh, how, how in, uh, much of a dire situation we're in. It's not just a matter of a choice. It's a matter of a corruption and inherited guilt we have from, eh, from Adam. So I just wanted to ask, these question, ask this question, well, where did, I'm going to come back to that question of it's not fair, but first I wanted to say, well, where did sin come from? Whoop, back here. Um, they didn't even know what sin was, did they? Um, did Adam know what sin was? Yes, he did. Oh, he did? God told him not to do it, and he did it. And it says in, uh, somebody can tell me where the passage is, but it says, Adam, Eve was deceived, Adam was not. He knew exactly what he was doing. He was not deceived. Um, he did it willfully, in rebellion against God is how it's, how it's said. So it's not from God, we, we know that. Deuteronomy 32.4 um, says that he is just and upright, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity or without sin. Um, Genesis 18, 25, um, it's when Abraham is uh, negotiating with God. We, a lot of people believe that's Jesus, a theophany, like bef uh, before he was incarnated. Um, he says, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And the implied answer is yes, because his, mm -hmm. his response is to Abraham as in, yes, I will. Job 34, 10 says, far be it from God that he should do wickedness and from the Almighty that he should do wrong. So it didn't, doesn't come from God. Um, it's not from a counterpower to God's goodness. And what I mean by this, some people have this idea that there's a dualism. In other words, that evil is as strong as good. You ever heard of this thing where you've got two wolves inside of you, one is good and one is evil, and whatever you feed yeah. goes stronger. Um, I understand the concept of that, but biblically that's wrong. <laughs> that's wrong. Um, it's, it's, it's practically true that you are what you feed yourself, but for a Christian, well, I have been set free from sin. So what it, it's more like there's a dog, I'm sla I am the one chained to righteousness. And instead of following righteousness, I invite the dog of evil into my life and feed it. And that's completely illogical. That's how Paul presents it. It's not, it's not two equal things. Um, Jesus is not the brother of Satan. Um, Satan is not as strong as God. That is not a, that's not a battle at all any more than an ant is as strong as me. <laughs> Right, and, and that's even that's even smaller and closer than God and Satan, because God created him, and with a word, He can uncreate him. Or if He just stops thinking about him, He can uncreate him. There's no, and there's no effort that goes into that. Um, so it's not it's not a counterpower. It's not a surprise to God either. Some there are some people out there. I believe it's called open theism, where they believe that God is learning. He doesn't know, and He sees, and He's doing the best job He can with what's there, and He is surprised by what comes, and, and they don't say it the way I say it, but ultimately that's what they're saying, is that God is surprised, and that's not what Scripture says. Um, it's not a surprise to him. Ephesians 1.11 says, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. All things is all things, and when you read the context of this, there's no context that would restrict the all things. All things are all things. Um, then Daniel 4.35 says, and he does according to his will, among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say, what are you doing? <laughs> Nobody can say to God, what are you doing? Right? Um, Job asked God that. Habakkuk asked God that. And the way he answered them was um, very humbling as a, as a person. Yeah. What's, that's, that's, that's Heather's favorite thing to say when there's chaos at our house and she walks what's into the room. Look, what's happening in here? What's going on? I am surprised by things that yes. happened. First Timothy 2.14, when you talk about that Adam was Oh, Eve was deceived, but not Adam. Adam was not deceived, but right. the woman, having been deceived, had come into judgment. Got it. Thank you. So that's why it comes, you hear so much, like you just said, Adam's sin affects us. And there's, there's another aspect to that, which we'll get here in a second. But I'm just going to go through these um, last few things. Where does sin come from? Not from God, but it was that, that, that there was sin was ordained by God. Uh, Satan's proper name is Lucifer. That's his, you might say, first name. He was the first being we know in Scripture that has sinned um, because he came and he deceived, right, the woman, and he led Adam astray. So he had to be in a point of sin before, so he probably fell before. Adam's sin, though, introduced sin to the created order. So this is the part that I don't like the answer, but I've read literally thousands of pages on this to try to find the answer to this from other people, and the conclusion is we don't know for sure. God doesn't share with us. And I go to Deuteronomy 29, 29, that says the secret things belong to us and our children that God has revealed to us. 
Uh, but there are some things that God keeps to himself. That's my, my paraphrase, but Deuteronomy 29, 29. And um, so I'm not going to spend time looking into areas where God has not specifically said. Um, I'll, I can think and speculate, but that's only in pencil, not in pen. <laughs> you know, and I'd rather not spend too much time on that either. But um, there's two, and it looks like I may not have included this, but you might say, well, that's not, do I have... I think I did it later. So we'll, we'll get to that's not fair. I think that's the part that I was like, well, that's not fair. But there are two aspects of the impact that we can experience and the scripture affirms that helps us understand this. Um, and for those of you who want to dig into this a little further, I got a lot of this, some of these outlines. A uh, person who did this really well, I found myself writing this out. And then as I was looking at some different things, I found that somebody had already done this. So I was just following their footsteps. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I kind of took some of their direction because it was very scripturally accurate. And that's um, from the Systematic Theology by uh, Wayne Grudem. So I want to give credit where uh, some of this comes from. Uh, but some people say the aspects of sin, so Adam's sin and so we all have sin. They talk about that as original sin or total depravity. There's a lot of things that fit underneath that. Both of those things create some confusion when I talk to people, when I share it to people who are not believers. And so I really like how Wayne Greedham uh, splits these out. He, he, he divides this into two areas, inherited guilt and inherited corruption. Um, and I think the word inherited is really important because I, I think you'll see why as we look at um, um, Hebrews 7 to give us an idea to kind of put our Middle Eastern caps, thinking caps on because that's who Jesus was speaking to, who Paul was writing to. Um, it, it's a different people than we have, and so it helps us to understand a little bit about how they thought about things so we can see what Paul was saying. It doesn't change the truth, but it helps us gain a little more clarity. Um, but inherited guilt and inherited corruption. So inherited guilt. Um, in Romans 5, 12, specifically 12 through 14, but 5, 12 says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So this inherited guilt means that we are counted guilty because of Adam's sin. Mm -hmm. So we inherit his guilt because of his sin. Um, this verse is not saying that all men directly committed acts of sin. If you read this carefully, it's saying that we sinned when Adam sinned. Okay, so just, just hold that thought. I'll, I'll give you some... Um, I'll expand on that a little bit because scripture does give us some hints of what that means. Because you might be saying, well, but I wasn't there. How can I be held accountable? And we'll get into that when we get to, uh, but that's not fair, a piece of this. But God views us as all having eaten the fruit that Adam was told not to eat. So in essence, it's as if we were right there with Adam and we ate it too. We're guilty. We inherit his guilt. Um, Paul expands this understanding. If you have your scripture, if you have your Bibles open to verses 13 through 14, you'll see that first of all, he, these are evidences. So 13 through 14 are evidences of what he just said. He just said, we all sinned in Adam. You say, well, how did I sin in Adam? Well, he's going to give you some reasons. First of all, mm -hmm. sin was in the world before the law. Does it make sense? So Adam sinned before there was a law, before there was a law. It was, somebody can help me out, maybe 1,200 years between Adam and Moses. I know there was about 400, 800 years between Abraham and Moses, or I think it was 480 years between Abraham and Moses. Um, and however many years between Abraham and Adam. So in, in that time between Adam and Moses, um, there was sin in the world. You say, well, how do I know there was sin in the world? Because it wasn't the law. How could there be sin? Right? Do you understand the logic there? If you didn't tell me that that was wrong, how can you say that was wrong? I'm ignorant. I don't understand, right? But the second thing is the penalty for sin, we would all, we all understand is what? Is death, Right? Um, and he says death reigned in the world from Adam to Moses. I mean, the thing that we know from Adam to Moses is that people died. Okay, so if death comes because of sin, there was no law. The logic is, well, there must have been sin in the world before there was law because people died. That's the logic he's giving there. Does that, does that make sense to follow that logic there? Um, the third thing is this, was, this is the one that's kind of the mind bender. This was true even to people who were not given a specific command. So I think this is getting closer to what you were asking. Well, how can I sin when there was no command? Because we think of sin as an act I commit. God's or think of a parent, right? Don't do that, Josiah. Mm -hmm. And he does it. Well, that's sin. But if I didn't say don't do it and he does it, I wouldn't punish him for it because I, that's my responsibility to let him know this is wrong, right? Um, then the fourth thing is sins were not counted against mankind because the law had not come. Now, that is an interesting statement because he's saying, 
God didn't count their, their sin, what they had done against them, because no law had come. So think of it this way. Uh, murder, right? Murder happened, in essence, but the law says do not murder, right? Uh, but people murdered before, and we know that, I mean, right? Cain murdered Abel. Um, there's a lot of murder that happens uh, between, between Adam and Moses, but he's saying here that he didn't count it against them, yet people still died. So you see, there has to be something other than sin that that person acted that comes because the law told me don't do this. Do you see the logic he's following here? And the last thing, yet, even though he didn't count it against them, people were guilty in God's eyes because they died. So this is kind of a deep logic thing, but he's in essence saying that sin was not sin of God saying don't do this. Sin had to come from somewhere else. Where did it come from? Well, he said in verse 12, it came because Adam sinned. So this is where we get this idea of inherited guilt. I inherit guilt from Adam, and because I inherit guilt from Adam, I die. Everybody dies. People die. Um, Because that's the punishment uh, that came to Adam because of his sin. Romans um, 8, sorry, 5, 18 through 19. um, Specifically, I'm going to call out a couple of phrases here. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. So you can say guilt. One trespass of one man made all men. And when I say men, I mean mankind, men, women, All people were guilty because of Adam's sin. That's what that first phrase says. The second one um, is going to say, the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. In other words, Adam disobeyed. Now everybody who comes from Adam disobeyed. Um, Mr. says, uh, you're not a horse thief because you stole a horse. You steal a horse because you are a horse thief. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I I like the phrase... um, we think we're sinners because we sin, and that is not true. We sin because we are sinners. We are born guilty sinners. And we'll see that in, in the second part here of inherited corruption. But what would you expect a sinner to do? Sin. Can I tell God it's Adam's fault, not mine? <laughs> uh, you can try that. Adam tried to blame his wife. Adam tried to blame his wife and it didn't work, so go ahead. I, you know what happens when you do that? <laughs> this is, and I'm very serious about this. When you blame somebody else, what you're doing is blaming God. Yeah. You're yeah. pointing the finger at him. I so if you want to blame God, God for your sin, uh, go ahead. I don't think it's going to end very well. No, I remember <laughs> yeah. you telling us that. Yeah. Yes, yes mom. <laughs> 2,433 years or almost 2,500 years. 2,500 years people died because mm-hmm. of Adam's sin before the law even came. And you think that's bad. It says at the end that the law came so that there would be more sin. <laughs> you know, so anyway. So the conclusion here is all members of humanity were represented by Adam at the time of testing in the Garden of Eden. Adam sinned, and God counts us all guilty because he sinned. That's what it's teaching here. Um, now you might say, as I've been trying to say and skip to it, this isn't, that's not fair. <laughs> it's not fair. Um, and there's really three answers that I've learned to give to this. And the last one I think is the best one. But you might have heard some of these. Um, first one, well, everybody has their own sins. You say, okay, well, fine. You say Adam didn't sin, but, but Romans 3.23 says we've all sinned, right? So your sin, you'll be held accountable for. Are you perfect? Are you saying you've never sinned before? So now you're pointing a finger at Adam and say, that's not fair. He, because he sinned, I'm going to die. Well, have you sinned? Well, then you would die for your sins to begin with. I mean, um, Romans 2.6 says he, speaking of Jesus, will render to each one according to his works, right? Um, Then Colossians 3.25 says, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there's no partiality. Nobody will get away with anything, period, full stop. Nobody will get away with anything. So that person that annoys you, that does things that are wrong, that oppresses you, that calls you names, that makes fun of you, things like that, they will have to answer for everything. Remember that. Wouldn't it be better to reach out to them and try to save them from the consequences of those actions rather than try to get back at them, (laughs) right? So just think about that. So a second answer is, well, if you were Adam, you would sin too. I mean, if you were there, you would have sinned. Have you ever heard this before? Well, well, if I was Adam, I wouldn't have sinned. I wouldn't have eaten the fruit. (laughs) To Uh To which I borrow one of my son Daniel's response. Really? Really? Yeah. Really? I, like, I thought you were going to say, I know. Really? Are you, you're saying that you wouldn't have sinned? Because you're so much better than Adam, right? So David, I know 
he went against what God told him. But did he understand sin? It doesn't matter if he understands sin. He disobeyed God. Okay. That is sin. Yeah. Okay. He rebelled against God. And he knew he had did wrong. He didn't know he he knew he had done wrong because what did he do? He hid. He hid. Yeah. Exactly. Why do you hide? Right. Okay. He knew. No, right? Thank you. Yeah. And lastly, just for the sake of time, um, this to me is the best way to answer this question. If you think it's unfair for Adam's sin to be transferred to you, then do you also think it's unfair that Christ's righteousness can become yours? Because we like to grab onto that one. That, that's good for me. I like that. But I don't like the bad stuff. We're so self-centered. <laughs> we love what's good for us, and we just ignore what's bad for us, and we fight against that. But this is, this is heaven's logic here. This is how God sees things. Whether we see it or not, that's not, that's not God's problem. That is our problem. And we need to repent of the wrong way of seeing this if Scripture clearly says it's one way. And I believe Scripture clearly says that it's that way, and I'll give you a reason why. Go ahead. Yes, I know. It's just amazing. And we've spent, and we, we will spend more time uh, next week looking at that, but yeah, we've, we've spent a lot of time, and that's the most amazing thing, because we're going to see in the second part, we are incapable of saving ourselves. So, um, so look at, um, you don't have to turn here, but Hebrews, you might say, well, um, that's, I don't understand how that works. How can I sin in Adam? Um, we're given a hint in Hebrews 7, 4 through 10. It's this really, you'll have to read it yourself. I'll just read a couple verses here. Um, but it's this idea, he's saying that, that Jesus, uh, or the Melchizedek, was greater than Abraham. And that would be a shocking thing for, for a Jew to say, uh, for a Jew to hear. But then he says, and Melchizedek, who was a priest, was even greater than your priest, which is Levi. And the, well, how can you prove that? He said, well, I'll prove it to you. Because guess what? Levi gave tithes to Melchizedek. And you might say, now, wait a second. I know that Levi wasn't alive, but you know what the logic is? And I'm not saying this is the writer of Hebrews' logic. This is God's logic. He says, Levi was in the loins of Abraham when Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. Therefore, Levi tithed to Melchizedek. And you tithe the person who's greater. So therefore, Melchizedek is greater than Levi. Mm -hmm. And you like, well, that's the logic, that's the heavenly logic that fits into the Abraham, when, I'm sorry, when Adam sinned, I sinned. All of us were in the loins of Adam when he sinned, all of us. And we understand from DNA, we all descend from Adam and Eve, right? Um, we were inside of Adam's body when he sinned, so therefore we all sinned. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, that's the uh, heavenly logic, so to speak. So let's... Don't have too much time. I'd love to go through more. But the second piece to help us understand this is what's called inherited corruption. This one is um, um, probably the most controversial. Um, I don't know why it is, because to me it seems so clear in Scripture, but some people really fight against this. Um, I think especially in the Western world, meaning in America, we're so individualistic of I'm responsible for what I do. You can't tell me what to do. I have my rights. You can't infringe on my rights and and I'm, I'm, a, I'm an autonomous being, and, and what I make are my own decisions. I have my own free will. I do my own thing. And other parts of the world, you don't get that. But here in America, you, I mean, you get some of that, but you don't get it as strong as you get here. So this, I think, is our cultural kind of thing. Um, but there's inherited corruption. If you look at Psalms 51.5, you probably can quote this to me, but it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, some people try to excuse that away and say, Oh, well, this is... This is David's mother. She, she, must have, she must have had some adulterous relationship, and she sinned, and so she, he was conceived in sin. Um, but if you look at the context, and context is king in Scripture, the context is David is, is asking for forgiveness for his sin, not for his mother's sin. There's no indication that he's talking about his mother there. He's talking about himself. So the context is David's sin, not his mother's. Then there's Psalm 58.3, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. So what happens before birth? Conception? Uh, they're, they're, they're basically, from birth, they're, they're liars. They're wicked. And that may be shocking. I, I remember one time um, somebody who was very close to Heather and I told us, oh, well, they're just innocent little kids. <laughs> you know? And I know what they're saying, but in God's eyes, there are no such thing as innocent human beings. They're all inherited the guilt of Abraham. I'm sorry, I keep saying Abraham, Adam. <laughs> Um, and so we're not going to get into the age of accountability? Or 
No, not, I, I want to, but I don't have enough time. Yes, yes, um, I, we, we will, I promise. I just, uh, I just didn't have time to fit that in. But um, Ephesians 2, 3, it says we were by nature uh, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. And he's speaking to us as believers. Us as believers, we were children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. So basically, all of mankind are children of wrath, not children of God. And there is this constant, there's a belief out there that people say, we're all God's children. We were all created by God, that is true. But Jesus clearly says, you're either sons of your father or you're sons of the devil, right? There's no in between. And here it says, you're either children of wrath or you're children who have been saved. Those are the two options, not children of God. And now you get closer to God. You are children of wrath. You are under, under wrath. And I know that's a hard thing to hear for us that are human, what we think about ourselves, but I'm just, I'm captive to what Scripture says. If you can convince me through Scripture, I promise I will change my view, but I believe this is what Scripture says. I like what Charles Swindoll said. I got this many years ago. He said, if sin was blue, we'd be blue all over. <laughs> just like that way of describing. Everywhere I am, everywhere you cut me, I'd be blue. That's how much sin is all throughout my character and my nature. Um, so the this does not mean that we're as wicked as we possibly could be. So when I say we're, we're corrupt, it doesn't mean that a person is as corrupt as they possibly could be. We have things like constraints of the law, expectations of family and society, our consciences, as we saw in Romans 2, 14 and 15, those all pr provide constraints. I personally believe that this is the restraining power of the Holy Spirit. Through these different things, this is how the Holy Spirit works to restrain sin in this world. And when it says in Revelation, I think it's in Revelation, where where his restraining power is removed, I think that's what he means is all these constraints that are there that hold sin back is removed. Um, those There's no longer any constraints to follow and become as wicked as a person desires to be, which is as wicked as they want to be. You looked at the illustration, it's not biblical, but like the Lord of the Flies, how it developed, like they um, digressed actually. Right. Like the sin became bigger and bigger and bigger because that... Uh, very beginning, they wanted order and things, but by the time they evolved, I would suppose, with right. paganism and all this, and it was almost like left to their own designs. You know? Yeah, the dominant belief in this world, in this, in our culture, and Heather runs across it a lot as a teacher, mm -hmm. is the reason that kids are in the situation, the, the reason they are what they are is because of their environment. Mm -hmm. So if you make the environment better, it'll make the kids better. Right, so that's why a lot of money is spent on schools, on interventions and things like that, because there's a strong belief that paradigm is that people are inherently good. And if you just put them in good situations, they're going to progress to something that's better. Um, and generally, that may be true, but still, in God's eyes, they're they're wicked. So this can be explained in a couple uh, ways, just in the time we have left. But in our nature, we lack any spiritual good. Um, every part of us is dead, corrupt, and capable of doing good outside of Christ. Every part, which means intellectual desires, our emotions, our goals, our motives. Romans seven fourteen says this, We know the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. Titus 1, 15 says, To the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? When the paradigm in Scripture is, my heart isn't cured, I'm given a new one. Mm. It's so bad, I'm given a new one. I have a, I'm a new creation, I have a new nature. I, I mean, things are new, not, not refurbished, so to speak. Um, so in our actions, we are, the second thing is, we are totally unable to do spiritual good. We can't even do what's good. Romans 8.8 8 says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. John 15.5 says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, he's speaking to his, his disciples. He's saying to his disciples, apart from me, you can do nothing. What about people that aren't his disciples? Surely they can do less than nothing. <laughs> they, they can't do they, whatever less than nothing is. Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Would it be safe to say then the law reveals what sin is? I, I would I would say the law the law increases sin in my life and makes me realize the purpose for the law is it increases it so much I realize I can't do this on my own. Can we say that I need help? The law reveals the glory of God. Yes. 
because uh, all our sins fall short of the glory I, of God. I would say it reveals his nature. Like we learn who he is by the rules that he gives us. Because all our sins fall short of the glory of God. Sin says fall short of the law. Right. So then the law would reveal the glory of God. I agree. So unbelievers are slaves to sin. In, John's, in John 8, 34, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave. Um, then even though through our perspective, people are good, you might say, well, I have this neighbor who's good and this one who is not so good. <laughs> and we kind of judge on a societal level. Um, but from God's perspective, even our righteousness is as a polluted garment. Um, and there's, it's a much worse word that's there. I'm just for in, in polite company say polluted garment. It's Isaiah 64, 6. The natural man cannot receive or under, can't even understand or receive the things of God. That's 1 Corinthians 2, 14. Um, says the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, it's foolishness. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And lastly, the natural person can't even come close to God on their own power. John 6, 44 says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So as you can see, there is not a lot of hope, right? Though not only are we legally guilty, we've inherited the guilt from, from, from Adam, we are born sinners, and we, are, we inherit his corruption as well. So as we saw in John 3, where it talks about, I don't do evil uh, just because I don't have anything else to do. I do evil and go to the darkness because I love doing what's wrong. I love my deeds so much, I don't even want to come into the light. In fact, I resist the light and push against it. And those of you who have witnessed to people who, are, who love their deeds and love their darkness, you've probably seen that just... Um, I like this phrase that sin is at its nature irrational. It is self-destructing, irrational, illogical when you see how God sees things. It's, it's irrational, but the response is irrational too. I don't want anything. I don't want, to know. I don't want life. I don't want your life. Let me work for you. I love my deeds of darkness, and that's this is what they're saying. They don't say it that way, but you know, that's kind of, kind of what they're saying. It's, it's very irrational. Um, I think... Yeah, so here's, here's just the answer um, as in closing. Uh, just a few more things to say, but in closing, Paul, you know, how does Adam's sin affect us? Um, hopefully you've seen that it's not just physical death. It's a legal guilt. It's a, it's a corruption that's within me. Um, it leaves us really with no hope. There really is no hope outside of Christ. Outside of Christ and God's effort, um, it's very consistent with what we studied a few weeks ago where uh, while we were still sinners, so while we were still dead, while we were still sinners, while we still hated God, while we were enemies of him, he died for us and reconciled us to himself. Amen. I mean, it's just, hopefully you see the depths of this, you see the greatness of our salvation um, by, by seeing the blackness of, of the hopelessness that we had, how great our salvation is. And it's only through a miracle. And really, we say, ah, I've never seen a miracle. And we think of you know, Jesus walking on water or giving food to lots of people. But each person that's sitting in here is the greatest miracle, and you probably don't even see it that way. But look at the hopelessness of a non-saved person, and each one of us are here, and we love God. How in the world did that happen? We've been studying how that happened. That is a miracle. It's God's work. Every single one of us are a work of God's hands and have been planned since the creation, before the creation of the world. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. So when you see people, and we're sitting next to each other worshiping in church, just look around and see all the miracles around you. And I don't mean that in a, uh, a sappy way. I mean, it really is. I want you to see past your paradigm of what you're used to. We get used to things, and then we, we go, okay, well, yeah, I, of course, these are believers and saints and things like that. But think of what that means, what God has done to save each one of us that's in this room, let alone what's going to be in the room next, let alone those people that you're witnessing to now that God may save at some point, the miracle that is needed. So when you pray for somebody to be saved, you're praying for a miracle. And when they become saved, when God reaches down and saves them, um, you have witnessed a miracle. One of the greatest miracles, because all the things and all the power of God, remember we've seen the beginning of Romans, is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. That is God's power. You see a miracle happening. So in closing the answer, in Adam, we all sinned. This resulted in legal guilt, deserving death. It caused all humans born of Adam to inherit a corrupt nature. Mm -hmm. Additionally, it impacted all of creation. We see it. So every pet death, every suffering of an animal, all those kinds of things go back to Adam's, 
Adam's sin. We tend to focus on human suffering, but if you expand that suffering to all suffering in the world, it is overwhelming. I mean, I'm just telling you, it's overwhelming. And God sees all of it. God sees all of it. And someday, it will all be redeemed. And that's our hope. Um, any comments on that before we close in prayer? I see a lot of people. So back to the... Back to the so God created everything, and he saw that it was good. Which yes. Which would include Adam. Yes. Okay. So he was not created with sin. That's right. Okay. Yeah, there's... I'm sorry to interrupt. There is, there's three... Um, I'm trying to remember how to say this in English, because in Latin they, they say it as, it's passe non pacare, but it basically is he... He could sin or he could not sin. He had the choice. He was the only person um, until the church, until the redeemed people, that could choose between what's right and wrong. So he was innocent, and he could choose between right and wrong. He chose wrong. All of us now, we can't, an unbeliever can't even choose right. You've seen those verses. They can't choose what's right. Their free will is bound to sin. So their free will is to choose which sin they're going to do, but not to do what is right. When we become believers, we are set free from that bondage. And now we can choose between what's right and wrong. The beauty is someday we'll move to that, the final stage, which is everything I want to do is right. There's no choice. It's I always choose what's right because I have the new nature. Sorry to interrupt you. Well, it just seems to me that there's a whole block of history here that we're unaware of or whatever before the creation because he's created good. Sin existed prior to, obviously not in God. Um, probably between when all he saw all the created was good. That there is a debate on that of when sin entered in the world. I personally believe it happened between he created all that was good and he said it was all good, and uh, and Adam fell. That that's when Satan fell. That's that's my belief. But what is sin, or where did it come? from? He doesn't from? say. So it's an unanswered question. It's one of those questions that we don't have an answer to. Some people say it's an absence of good. But um, th there's some prob there Every answer that I have seen has some serious holes in it. I've not been able to find an answer scripturally. There's some play people that give a lot of logic and diagrams and pictures and stuff, but I've never seen an answer that's scriptural that, that doesn't have any holes in it that's echoed throughout scripture. It's just one of those things he hasn't shared with us. It's interesting that that gap of knowledge, probably intentional, still affects creation and every single person then from that point yep. down. Yep. But we don't know where that part fits. Right. Okay, thank yep. you. Yeah, I, I would like to know, just because I'm curious. You know, when you read in Revelation, he says it gives us a name that nobody knows. Um, my first question is, well, what is it? <laughs> I want to know, what is that? You know, and, and I just have to be, I, I think that's what Deuteronomy 29 and 29 is saying is, it's ba I think God is instructing us to focus on all the things he has given us because there's a full-time job understanding that. I, I'm not disparaging because I ask the same questions, and so I have to take a deep breath and focus on the good of what he has shared with us. And maybe someday he'll share it with us, but there is, I hear some people say, someday when we die, God will explain it all to us. I don't find that in Scripture either. <laughs> I do think we'll understand more, um, but um, it, it says in Scripture that through all eternity, he'll be unveiling his glory to us more and more and, and more. How can you know more and more if you know everything and become like him? Okay. Yeah, so and the I, angels even look in awe over what he's done. And the angels don't understand. <laughs> they look at us. One more thing, and then i got to pray. Sorry. Um, one of the things I keep thinking of is what we inherited from Adam is the sin nature to choose rather than to choose good. Yeah. I, I, would, uh, I would say it a little different. I would say we inherited a corrupt nature that I choose what I want, and what I want is always evil. There's nowhere in Scripture it says that an unbeliever, somebody is a natural man, I think is the way that Paul says it, that can choose what is right. And even what is right from our definition, God sees as wicked. Because anything that's not of faith is sin. Even uh, Psalm says even the plowing of the wicked is, is, is wicked. Say, what? Providing for my family, going out and plowing, we'd say, that's good. God says, no, it's wicked. It's not done from faith. Anything that's not done from faith is wicked. So even things we define as good, we're again judging on the outside. God sees the heart and the motivations, and even the motivations of, of things that we say are good are considered evil in God's sight. In other words, he's not going to weigh and say, oh, you did some good things, but most of these were evil. He says, no, everything is evil. 
because you were you were of your father the devil and that you followed the father your de- the father the devil you did these things and you were a liar and you were wicked and there's I never knew you so depart from me yeah Way more. I, I think we're so used to judging good as what we see on the outside. If you really take time and see as God sees it, there is no good outside of those who are, in, who are saints. We are, we are the only people, Scripture, that has the ability to choose what is right. And that is, even, that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's sanctification. That's the Holy Spirit works in me, and I work through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these truths. We thank you for these things that stimulate our mind. Uh, we, we, it seems like you did answer the prayer of opening our hearts to be able to see these things. We pray that they would just stick with us. We would think about them as we watch uh, sports and sitcoms and interact with our friends and family and at work and things like that. We pray that you would just give us eyes to see the way you see things, especially help us see the dire need of those around us that are not in you. We pray that we'd be, just give us a passion and a heart for the loss of those around us. And we pray that we would just be encouraged and strengthened to witness to them, open doors of opportunity so we could walk through to share the gospel with them. So they too can have a choice of doing what is right that pleases you and that can have eternal life through the righteousness that comes from your son. We pray that all these things would work for the glory of your son. And in your son's name we pray. Amen.